Welcome to worship wherever you are, however you're tuning in. It is a joy to gather to praise the Lord. Today I gratefully welcome the, the Reverend Dr. Barbara Bundick to the pulpit. Thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, please note that session has called a congregational meeting for next Sunday, November 22nd. We will be holding that meeting uh, over Zoom. So watch your email and mail to um, get the link to join over the internet or the telephone number to call in either on a landline or a mobile phone. We'll be voting on a change to our bylaws and a slate of officers as indicated in the November newsletter. If you have any questions, please call the office. Today was scheduled to be Stewardship Sunday, but we are not able to gather and turn in our pledges. Uh, you have hopefully received a letter through the mail asking you to prayerfully consider what God is calling you to give toward the ministry of Christ's church. We cannot gather and bless our commitments today, but we ask that you make every attempt to return your estimate of giving for 2021 by December 1st. It is amazing what work Christ does through your gifts. The November newsletter has information on ordering poinsettias and participating in our upcoming Advent book discussion. Please contact the office if you have questions. Chris Nadel, Mary Grace Matheson, and Steve Bingham all have birthdays this week. Happy birthday to you all. We give thanks this week for all the healing God has performed and for all the humans who participated in that healing. Please hold in your prayers Tim Arnold, who is recovering from surgery, and Marty Subchuk, who was scheduled for surgery on Friday at the time of this recording. Keep in your prayers all those in this congregation and in the world who are suffering the effects of or are at risk of contracting COVID-19. Let us worship God. Good morning. Our call to worship. Show us your ways, O Lord. Lead us in your truth and teach us. Open our eyes, minds, and hearts to know your will and to follow it. Reveal your vision for us and keep us focused and faithful to what you would have us do. Bring us together to worship and work for your purpose and move us forward into your future. Amen. Our Confession of Faith God of justice, in baptism you anointed us to live boldly in the reality of your coming kingdom. We confess that we have not fulfilled our calling. We have not used your power to serve our neighbors. We have walked away from oppression and injustice. We have turned our backs on your beloved children who hunger and thirst in a world of plenty. Forgive us, Lord. Make us courageous servants of your justice, peace, and wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Our assurance of pardon. The peace of Christ surpasses our understanding. Receive it, celebrate it, and live into it with joy. Hi, Erin Kay here, member of the PNC. We feel extremely grateful that we were chosen by the nominating committee and approved by the congregation. And we feel very blessed to be on this team together. So during these crazy times, yet in this digital world, the PNC meets virtually on a weekly schedule. We follow a set agenda and we assign tasks to team members to work during the week. We use Microsoft Teams as a tool to communicate and track our activity. Uh, the pastor nominating committee, being a representative of the whole congregation, is responsible for nominating a minister for election as our next pastor. All six members of your pastor nominating committee signed a covenant of spiritual maturity, committing to how we will conduct ourselves to this task of spiritual discernment, listening for the voice of God to guide us on this journey. 
and we appreciate your continued support from the congregation for prayers for the PNC and the pastor call process. I am Robert McMahon, and as a member of the PNC group, I would like to share something about our group with you today. During the PNC meetings, a member reads a devotion. The reading has a theme that reflects what tasks the group is to work on for the next week. This devotion helps us spiritually arrive at the right frame of mind. We can then begin to open our hearts and minds to find God's guidance in the search for a new pastor, and we need to listen for that guidance to find the person for our church. The Pastor Nominating Committee has completed our Ministry Information Form. It has been accepted by the session and is being sent to the Presbytery. It will soon appear online for our candidates to view. Now that we have our information in the system, we need your help to spread the word. If you know of a person or a network where we could reach our potential pastor, please pass on our information. We are filled with joy and anticipation and expectation, believing God already knows who our next pastor will be. Our job as your PNC is to follow God's guidance and nudging and be led to the person God has chosen. Pray with us. God's will be done. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten young bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now five of them were wise, and the other five were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps, but didn't bring oil for them. But the wise ones took their lamps and also brought containers of oil. When the groom was late in coming, they all became drowsy and went to sleep. But at midnight there was a cry. Look, the groom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. But the foolish bridesmaids said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps have gone out. But the wise bridesmaids replied, No, because if we share with you, there won't be enough for our lamps and yours. We have a better idea. You go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the groom came. Those who were ready went with him into the wedding. Then the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But the Lord replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep alert, because you don't know the day or the hour. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's obvious that our Bible passage for today wasn't set in 21st century Woodstock, Illinois. Any Woodstock groom who kept the wedding party waiting till midnight would arrive at an empty, dark church. Worse yet, if he went to the bride's house, if he dared show his face at the bride's house, he'd find the door shut tight against him. The bride would loudly say to him, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. The Gospel of Matthew likes to warn people about wailing and gnashing of teeth. Our Woodstock groom would definitely be wailing and gnashing his teeth. Of course, Jesus wasn't describing 21st century Woodstock. Jesus' parable is based on a first century Galilean wedding. The bride would wait at her family's home with the bridesmaids gathered all around. The groom would come to escort the bride to the groom's home for the wedding with the bridesmaids and their brightly lit lamps all forming a grand festive parade. The wedding party could last all week. Of course, there were always last minute arrangements that sometimes had to be made, which meant that it wasn't unusual or outside acceptable norms for grooms to be late. Apparently, waiting on grooms was an occupational hazard for brides and bridesmaids in, 21st, in first century Galilee. This parable is about waiting. Chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew are all about waiting. Jesus entered Jerusalem in style, riding on a donkey, greeted by crowds waving palm leaves. He went straight to the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. He preached. He got the powers that be, Jewish and Roman alike, good and glaring mad at him. All that was left was the Last Supper, the garden, and the cross. Jesus was waiting. The disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus warned them against false prophets, wars and rumors of war, and all other manner of telltale signs, only to add that nobody knows when that day will come. He then told the disciples three parables, all of which involved people waiting while the master was away. How do the servants behave when the master of the house is out of town? Will he return to find them doing their duties or shirking them? What do the bridesmaids do when the groom is late? Will they have oil when he arrives? How do the servants handle the master's money while he's gone? Will they invest it or bury it in the backyard? Which raises the question, what do we do when we're waiting? We discussed today's parable at our Wednesday morning Bible study meeting. Get this, the morning after the no results election day with no end to the vote counting in sight. When would we know who the next president would be? We also talked about our friends in this congregation who've tested positive for COVID-19. How are they doing? And while we're at it, when will we have a vaccine? When will it be safe to see our grandchildren? When can we hug the people we love? When will this blasted pandemic be over with anyway? How do we live while we're waiting? Jesus told a parable about that. Ten bridesmaids, some wise, some not so wise, gathered around the house of their friend, the bride, to wait with her for the groom. Time passed, no groom. The sun set, no groom. One by one, the bridesmaids nodded off to sleep, no groom. Finally, a loud cry pierced the night. The groom is coming, get ready to party. Quickly, the women checked their lamps, which had been burning for some time now. 
only to discover that five of them had not brought any extra oil. Off the five women flew to get oil. They must have had 24-hour hardware stores back in Jesus' day because the women were able to get oil, even though it was midnight, but they were too late. The party had gone on without them, and they couldn't get in. The door was shut against them. So what made these five bridesmaids so foolish and the other bridesmaids so wise? Uh, Let's be clear. The problem was not the fact that the bridesmaids all fell asleep. All ten of the bridesmaids fell asleep, not just the five foolish ones. Insomnia is not a biblical solution to waiting. Instead, as one commentary pointed out, since it wasn't all that unusual for grooms to be late, the bridesmaids who brought extra oil with them displayed common sense and reasonable preparation. The five bridesmaids who didn't bring oil with them clearly didn't honor the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. A second commentary, however, had a different idea. The women weren't foolish because they failed to bring enough oil, careless as that might have been. They were foolish because they left their post to get oil. They should have waited, even without oil, to greet the groom. Of course, that's all well and good for Galilean bridesmaids. What about us, waiting here in the midst of a pandemic, Jesus told the disciples to keep alert because you don't know the day or the hour. How can we keep alert in our waiting? What oil do we need? There is oil, good biblical oil, in plenty all around us, free for the taking. Believe it or not, it's called stewardship. And I do mean stewardship. I'm not just talking stewardship to make the finance committee happy. I love the way the dictionary.com defines stewardship. The responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. There are two parts to that definition. The first part, responsible overseeing and protection, is something we've all heard about. I've preached many a sermon about how Christian discipleship is all about faithfully managing our time, talent, and treasure. Of course, time, talent, and treasure cover a lot more ground than just giving generously to this congregation. Not that I want to discourage anyone from giving generously to this congregation. Do give generously to this congregation. We cash all checks. But even more important, be responsible in how you oversee and protect your time, talent, and treasure in every other aspect of your lives as well. Would the world be facing climate change if human beings were better stewards of our planet? I don't think so. It's the second half of the dictionary.com definition, though, that I want to hold up for you. Stewardship isn't just responsible overseeing and protection. It's responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. What in your life is worth caring for and preserving? Again, we've all heard and I've certainly preached sermons about how we don't own our stuff, our stuff owns us. Is the stuff we protect truly worth caring for and preserving? As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus told us to keep alert while we wait. If we spend our pandemic time as stewards, then we will be focusing on what is worth caring for and preserving. It's easier, at least easier, to keep alert when we're focusing on stuff that's worth it. That's where those two different commentaries I talked about earlier come together. One commentary complained that the five bridesmaids were foolish because they didn't bring extra oil. The other commentary complained that the five bridesmaids were foolish because they left their post to get oil. Either way, the five bridesmaids were not focused on something worth caring about. They were not focused on greeting the groom. 
and celebrating their friend's wedding. Get your focus straight and the rest follows. Stewardship won't make the waiting easy or fun. It won't make the uncountable, unnecessary COVID deaths, the economic devastation, and the suffering yet to come this winter any less tragic. Caring for what's worth caring for includes grief. The British theologian N.T. Wright recommends that while we wait, we should also lament. He says grief, after all, is part of love. Not to grieve, not to lament, is to slam the door on the same place in the innermost heart from which love itself comes. Waiting as stewards opens our heart to all that is worth caring about, love most of all. To quote T.S. Eliot, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. Wright also quotes Martin Luther, the original Martin Luther, who lived through a pandemic long before anyone knew about germ theory. With God's permission, the enemy has sent poison and deadly dung among us, and so I will pray to God that he may be gracious and preserve us. Then I will fumigate to purify the air, give and take medicine, and avoid places and persons where I am not needed, in order that I may not abuse myself, and that through me others may not be infected and inflamed, with the result that I become the cause of their death through my negligence. If God wishes to take me, he will be able to find me. At least I have done what he gave me to do, and am responsible neither for my own death nor for the death of others. But if my neighbor needs me, I shall avoid neither person nor place, but feel free to visit and help him. And there you have it. Martin Luther's remedy for waiting through a pandemic is, drum roll please, stewardship. Someday the pandemic will come to an end. Election night and the first round of vote counting came to an end. The recounts and the runoff races will come to an end. There is always an end. And darn it all, after one thing ends, there will always be something new to come along that we will also have to wait through. And always then, as now, the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. So with Christ before us and stewardship in our hearts, let us wait together for our next waiting. That's the oil we need. Amen. Let us pray. Hear, O Lord, the prayers of your people. Incline your ears to the words of our mouth. We call out to you on account of your faithfulness, for you are the ancient of days, and your word never fails. Keep faith with those in need today as you have forever before, so that we might sing your praises for generations to come. Be faithful to the young who are just learning the ways of the world. Be faithful to those who are older and especially to those who struggle with disease. Be faithful to those who are divided over the best future for our country. Be faithful to those who are poor, injured, grieving, or under threat, that your wholeness, your peace, your reconciliation, and your joy may be restored. We put our trust in you, remembering your gracious works made real for us in Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go in stewardship to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.